would you be giving some other guidelines which the youngsters would take up? Um, the guidelines might be basic wisdom for everyday life. How can spirituality and theology provide solace, purpose and resilience in people's lives? You know, there's a war here, a war there, there's bombing going on because we need to work together against the forces of chaos and evil that are around us. So uh, you would be uh, in the footsteps of uh, Swami, like would you be giving some other guidelines which the youngsters would take up in this journey? Well, I think um, the guidelines might be basic wisdom for everyday life. Mm -hmm. So when you think of when you're young, what kind of values do you want to have that will carry you through life? So first of all, to have a sense of humility. Yes. I'm, I'm not able to do everything. I'm not super person, not superman, superwoman. Um, I need to realize my limitations. Also that I, I am not arrogant. I'm not always knowing more than the person I'm talking to. So some kind of humility, mm -hmm. uh, some kind of open-mindedness mm -hmm. is also important. That no matter how staunchly I believe or study my own religion, I can still learn from other people's religions. So a sense of humility, mm -hmm. a sense of open-mindedness. As I said before, I mean, also basically, don't say things unless you know what you're talking about. And some people can get in the bad habit of just talking and talking, and they like, as we say, the sound of their own voice. But somehow a sense of, I speak with truth. I speak authentically as I am. That's another rule. Maybe a fourth one would be, be patient. Mm. And I can speak with great experience because I came to India first 50 years back. So many of the people listening to this today will be much, much younger than me. But to say, well, when you are 20, 25, you're only getting started. And that you can't say, if I'm not finished by 30, I'll give it up. But rather at 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and then 80, 90, 100, it's a lifelong journey that just as love, you think of love between two people, let's say a husband and wife, when they're newlyweds, there's a certain kind of excitement and energy to the wedding. But then after they're married 10 years and have children, and then they start getting older, they still have to keep saying, we will learn to love each other, we'll learn to live together. And so you, the, one of the most wonderful things we see in life is like a happy old couple. They've been married 55 years, and they're not the young people they were 55 years ago, but they're still happy to be together, they're still walking together, they hold each other when they're crossing the street and so on, mm -hmm. like that religiously that we first, when we're young, think of our own religion, then we encounter the other religions around us. And don't think that that's the end of it, that's only the beginning. And that what I understood when I was in Kathmandu in 1973, first learning about Krishna, first going to the stupas of Buddhism, the Kali temple and so on, I was only getting started. And 20 years later, I was getting started. And now that I'm 72, only getting started. And I think it just takes a lifetime. And, and then finally, one more thing, just to say, uh, realizing that it's not up to us entirely, it's not in our hands. There are other people around us we need to work with, we need to cooperate with our friends and neighbors and family. And then ultimately, if, if we're believing in God, that God is leading us on a path and never stop praying. Keep a spiritual life alive when you're young and when you're old. And if we do all this, then we'll all be happy and interreligiously happy. Yeah. If everybody understands that, then the world will be a beautiful place. Yes. So. Amidst the challenges and uncertainties of the modern era, how can spirituality and theology provide solace, purpose, and resilience in people's lives? Mm. So as, as I said before, I think we're living in a difficult world. And if you read the newspapers or look online at different media, every day there's bad news. You know, there's a war here, a war there, there's bombing going on, innocent people are being killed. Then there's environmental disasters, you know, not only floods and tornadoes, droughts. And then this July, July 2023, record heat waves. 
all over the world. And so there are things to worry about. And also our societies, I think, are in some ways coming apart. So I'll speak only about the US that I think maybe 30, 50, 70 years ago, Americans had much more in common religiously because most people were Christian. And a sense of common decency, trust, tell the truth, respect your neighbor, be charitable. So much of that is coming apart. And we see, again, in the United States, politicians who just talk. They don't believe what they say. They rabble rouse. And they are say, I am in this for me. You should be in this for you. And if we work together, we'll take it from them and we'll have it. So many problems in our world. And I think faith and interfaith can help us to survive. I mean, so many people in trouble were often surprised to see you go to the poorest neighborhood, let's say in um, somewhere in, in Latin America or somewhere in Mumbai, let's say. Mm -hmm. uh, the poorest people or migrants crossing the Mediterranean Sea, many of them say, I survived this long because God was with me. A and they lost everything. And there's you know, drought and fire and war. They say, my faith has gotten me through. And some people say, well, if the world is so bad, why don't you just drop your faith and be cynical? But many people say, no, there's the spiritual element. There's something greater than what we see before our eyes that is important. And therefore, you can't make yourself keep faith. You can't just snap your fingers and say, I have faith. But some sense that God has a plan for the world and for our lives, even when we're in trouble. And then likewise, interreligiously, it's no longer possible, again, in the United States to say, we're all Christians and we'll ignore the people who are not Christian, who are a tiny minority. People, more and more people of different faiths are living together. Uh, young people are spiritual but not religious, crossing boundaries back and forth. And so those of us who have some kind of leadership role, uh, like a priest or at a university professor, to show that, again, in a complex society with many troubles, being intelligent, learning, being patient, and always working with people of other faith traditions as my friends, my neighbor, my allies, will help us for a better world. If we just say, well, the Christians should just work with Christians and the Muslims should just work with Muslims, that's not enough because we need to work together against the forces of chaos and evil that are around us. So we have to be together interreligiously if we're gonna make it, the world a better place. Having said all this, could you just recount a memorable experience or encounter with leaders and communities of different faiths that has deeply influenced your understanding of spirituality and interfaith dialogues? So I, I've been in, in many interfaith meetings over the years, and I can think of examples that have stuck with me. Uh, one was memorable in 2015, Pope Francis came to the United States and he big fanfare, he was in New York, Washington, spoke to Congress and so on. But he came on one day in his visit down to what we call Ground Zero, where in on September 11th, 2001, those two planes hit the World Trade Center, which collapsed and 3,000 people died. He came to that place and there was a large interfaith gathering. There were maybe 500 of us, all different religious traditions who had gathered to pray with the Pope. And first he met privately with the families of the victims. Then he came in and there were prayers and music. Uh, people of different faith traditions got up and did readings from their traditions. And then he got up and gave a beautiful talk about how in times of sadness, when we have tears in our eyes, all the more so to be spiritual and interfaith people. Uh, that was one example. Um, has stuck with me over the years, that even something evil like 9-11 can lead to an interfaith gathering. And then just two or three weeks ago, I was in Varanasi uh, visiting uh, some friends and also going around. I went to a, for a program on a Sunday to a place called Maitri Bhavan, like the place of friendship, the place of good neighbors. And I was one of the speakers but the idea was that people who are Muslim and Hindu and Buddhist and other faiths all gathered just on a hot Sunday afternoon to talk about why are we religious people? Uh, what does it mean to be a religious person in today's world? 
And I think, well, that's only a few weeks ago. I think that will stick with me because it was ordinary people on an ordinary Sunday who said, we, sh we have to do this. We have to come and be together. We have to learn from one another if we're going to make the world a, a safer place. I could add probably 10 more examples of, of situations that I thought of, but I think any time I've been in an interfaith meeting or an interfaith conversation, it can at first be awkward because I pray best with people of my own faith. We know, we Catholics know exactly what to do. The Muslims know what to do. The Hindus know what to do. But after we begin to find a way to be together, some spiritual contact, then have the most wonderful conversations. And I think that kind of element, that this always is a good thing, um, would stick with me in all the small conversations that I've been part of over the years. But I highlight that one of the Pope at Ground Zero as a big example of interfaith, harmony, and love in the face of terrible violence. So thank you so much for your time. You. And I feel we are deeply touched with your humble answers and thought-provoking ideas, guidelines given by you. Because today's youngsters, they need some sort of uh, direction mm. for them to be moving in the right path. Yes. And all your answers, I feel, are going to inspire them. Uh, How is that in this diverse condition? They could respect yes. and then coexist. Yes. So thank you so much for thank your you, time. Thank you, Dr. Chitra. My pleasure to be here. And my message to the young people is, you are the future. The world is in your hands. Therefore, do the best you can to be people of faith with respect for your neighbors. Let us all hope that this comes true. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Yes, with this, we come to the end of this interview. Thank you 